Welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. And sometimes we allow for the fact that Emily Jashinsky is an interesting person once a month. Uh, we allow for this fact. Uh, Emily is over at The Federalist as their cultural editor. She's a fellow with us at IW. Uh, she is one half of um, Counterpoints on Breaking Points with Crystal and Sager. And you've likely seen her el elsewhere around. She's with YAF, teaching young journalists. Did I get all your hats? I feel like you probably have six new hats since the last time I memorized this pitch. No, that's it. But I will add that not only am I a fellow with you, I am a senior fellow. Oh yeah, we can't. The, we can't forget that you, women. you're now you're now older than thirty. So yeah, so I'm senior. I qualify. <laughs> it's like you get to, at, at IW. It's sort of like AARP. <laughs> yeah, you get your your AARP card with us when you get that senior attached. Yeah, um, my beard is grayed. <laughs> uh, nothing makes me feel older. Than these episodes, um, <laughs> especially when we talk about TV shows. Uh, so, but today we're going to start off not with TV shows, but with uh, Title IX. How do you like that transition? Very smooth <laughs> uh, from banter to the absolute destruction of the definition of sex and federal law. So wh what do you think about that, Emily? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a very smooth transition. And frankly, uh, we talked about this a little before we started, but I'm eager to hear more of your analysis because this is so complicated. I mean, in a basic sense, it's not complicated at all. It's uh, just an assault on, um, you know, the standards of law and of women, and we'll get into all of that. But uh, they also, I think, intentionally crafted a very complicated rule uh, I think it's by design. So I'm, I'm honestly just eager to hear more from you because you've been uh, doing legal analysis of this for like a, more than a decade, a decade at this point. It's 2024. Yeah, I mean, and there's been a lot of changes in, in that time. But um, yeah, I mean, th something this big is hard to to talk about in little sound bites. So I am glad we're, we're having this conversation because each one of the changes that are made, the major changes that are made... Um, it, it, each one of them could is its own discussion and each one of them deserves more than a five minute segment. But uh, the three buckets that I would break this down into is the first, um, of course, the one that's getting the most attention rightfully. So is, is the redefinition of sex. Um, and that includes now uh, gender identity, self-professed gender identity. Um, and what's more, these regulations say that it's harmful. It's harmful to a student to treat that student as his or her actual birth sex, biological sex. Um, now, this is a bit speculative, um, so I don't want people to sort of run with this idea too far. It's not something that I would um, say is definitive. I do think the harm language is um, laying a groundwork for potentially for mandatory reporting, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we now have a federal regulation. The federal government's official position is that treating a child as the sex that they're born um, does harm to that child. And there are all kinds of, of other rules about what, um, you know, what teachers, what employees of, of the government or employees of organizations that take money from the government are supposed to do when they see a child being harmed. Mm. Um, so in my opinion, that's not an accident, but that is speculative. Of course, the plain reading, the non-speculative reading of this is that uh, bathrooms, locker rooms, um, we're talking, you know, kindergarten all the way up through, you know, postgraduate school, any institution that takes any federal money um, has to now uh, basically treat students as the gender identity that they identify as um, rather than as their biological sex. Now, there's there's a bit of um, what is, in my opinion, a completely dishonest sleight of hand. Uh, and politically, I'm curious uh, how, how you, you think this breaks down. But we've had a lot of Biden political type people coming out and saying, no, 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 this doesn't <laughs> apply to women's sports. We're going to mm. make a separate rulemaking um, with regard to women's sports. I think it does show that they're afraid of the women's sports issue where it's so clear that when you're throwing, you know, the dudes, Leah Thomases into the pool next to women, um, that there are particular biologically determined outcomes. Uh, I think they're afraid of that issue. And I think that's why they're trying to push it off over the election. But the plain reading of these 
rules also applies to sports and the Biden administration is filing in federal court saying it applies to sports. So it's, for example, telling West Virginia, the state of West Virginia, that they can't have a law that keeps women's sports limited to females um, because it's in violation of Title IX. So their administration's already contradicting that um, that statement. But I don't know. Why do you think so? Like, what's your read on sort of the politics around around women's sports and, and why the Biden administration is trying to carve that out from the rest of us? You know, it's interesting because in some sense, if we go back to how this all started, and we've talked about this many times in this, the Dear Colleague letter, the first one was that 2011 or 2012 uh, from the Education Department? I think 2011. But 2011, yeah, I think that's what it was. Long forgotten. Right. around It was around 2011 or 2012, uh, but I think it was 2011. The Obama Education Department uh, actually issued what is called a Dear Colleague letter, and Inez knows this better than I do, uh, that immediately changed the policies for any school that accepted federal funding. And that's every school for the most part, with the exception of what Hillsdale and a couple of other uh, more conservatively need schools. And that decision, to your point now, uh, it set the tone about the feds overriding uh, state-based policies on uh, and, and school-based policies, by the way, on how to adjudicate sexual assault. That was followed up by what a 2015 or 2016 dear 2016 dear colleague letter, I think it was from John King, then Education Secretary under Obama, to write gender identity into the definition of sex in Title IX. Again, this is a dear colleague letter. It's not going through Congress, legislation, any of that. It is just a piece of paper from the education department that's changing policy across the country uh, at the flick of a pen, essentially. And that to me is what's really fascinating about so much of this um, because it gets into that deeper conversation about how civil rights law nationalized some of these discussions. You could talk about Christopher Caldwell or Hanania. Other people have written at length about what civil rights law did. Uh, but even something as innocuous as Title IX set the stage for when we have these competing definitions of sex, which nobody ever thought would happen uh, because it was typically relegated to like the fringes of academia. Nobody ever thought that we would lose our consensus on what it meant to be a woman, that uh, Caitlyn Jenner, that a, that a man essentially would be named woman of the year in 2015. I think that happened. It just, it was so unthinkable to our culture, especially back in the 1970s. Um, the consequences weren't easily <laughs> foreseen. Um, and the same thing with like executive power, but it's, I, I think probably in that is that they understand, especially locally, swing states where Joe Biden needs to compete, you know, somewhere like Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, these policies are really, really unpopular. And they're so popular though, in some deep blue areas that it's kind of this trap of, you know, the left's own making for Biden. It's like, does he not do it and risk all of the powerful sort of LGBT special interest groups denouncing him in an election year and pressuring him in an election year, plus his own staff uh, likely is demanding this, people in the education department? Uh, or does he just sort of do this too cute by half, clever, oh, well, we're still working on that. Uh, we don't know, you know exactly how this is going to shake out. I I'm guessing that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it seems like that's where Biden is on a lot of issues, right? Trapped between an activist base uh, and basically knowing that uh, he can only appeal to moderates and only, and frankly, like on the, on these kinds of issues, like women's sports, you know, we're talking about quite a few Democrats as well um, who are really, really turned off by this, like, I mean, I can't believe we're actually having a conversation about people being politically turned off about the idea that, you know, <laughs> men can show their penises in women's mm. locker rooms. Like, this seems like a very, very basic thing. Um, but yeah, he is trapped between his own activists. And, and um, but one, one issue in Title IX that Biden himself is an activist on uh, mm. is due process. Mm -hmm. uh, and more specifically, eviscerating it, um, which is particularly galling given the, the way that the accusations that Tara Reid levied against Biden of sexual misconduct were 
uh, treated. But uh, nevertheless, this is something he was involved in. What you recalled what was happening in the, the Obama administration. This is something Biden was involved with as vice president. Um, this this uh, systematic encouragement of schools and now codified encouragement of schools in this regulation uh, to ignore the standards that courts have put forward repeatedly about adjudication of allegations of sexual misconduct. So, I mean, this this Title IX regulation, I like to say, has something for everybody in the sense that it completely eviscerates women's rights uh, to privacy, safety, fair competition. Um, but it also completely eviscerates men's rights uh, in terms of having a fair process if somebody is accused of some kind of sexual impropriety. I mean, this is star chamber stuff. This is a complete reversion to the Obama years. A single investigator model is green lighted once again, which means a Title IX investigator, you know, somebody who has dedicated their life, life to this like very expansive definition of sexual assault trauma-informed understanding. So, you know, doesn't look at the types of evidence like, you know, um, a, a girl texting a guy back multiple times throughout the weeks after he allegedly assaulted her, right? Um, that person can now fully adjudicate the trial. You're talking about, quote unquote, trial. You're talking about, um, <laughs> you're talking about like, uh, you know, kids really, you know, they're adults, but they're walking into these hearings with no representation, no ability to cross-examine through representation. Sometimes they don't even know what they're accused of when they're walking in specifically. All they know is that they're accused of sexual misconduct, right? As opposed to saying, mm -hmm. on Friday the 11th, right, you did X, Y, and Z. Somebody is accusing you of having done X, Y, and Z. Like, they don't know that until they walk into the hearing. Um, that's what was happening under Obama, and that's what is, we're headed back this way. So, I mean, but so many things that happened in this administration it seemed to be essentially millennial activists running on autopilot. But this, I mean, this particular thing, Biden has a long history of supporting. I am actually, now I have a question for you. If you think, because my understanding is that this new policy, as you said, it green lights that standard. It does take us back to the kangaroo courts of the Obama era, which were so such a disaster that, you know, it, they ended up being the subject of long critical investigations in the Atlantic by Emily Yaffe. The Washington Post editorial board uh, was unhappy with it. There were some real criticisms even from the left in the Obama era because it was so egregious. It was so bad. My understanding of the new policy is that it basically gives campuses the option to go back to that if they so choose, which I'm curious what you think, Inez, if that had happened during the Obama administration, people forget. This was the era of like Lena Dunham's peak. Uh, I was on college during this time period and it was all like this fever pitch about rape culture, suffocating women on campuses. It was, it was like hysterical. I kind of wonder if this concession had been made during the Obama administration, if, you know, politically Obama and Biden, Biden, you're so right, was at the tip of the spear uh, during the Obama administration on this particular policy. I feel like they would have been pilloried and forced to walk it back. So in some sense, it's kind of an interesting concession almost. Yeah, you might be right about that. I mean, we talked about the the weird sort of backdoor resurgence of Me Too last time, last month, I feel like. And I think this is part of the same shift where there was so clearly a backlash, um, not just during the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, there's a political backlash when that kind of, of um, even though it was a totally different context than a college trial, right? Um, it, it showed how an accusation can completely destroy someone's career, or their life. And um, you know, <laughs> have they can have very little way of of you know proving themselves innocent, which is really what what's happening in the court of public opinion. Um, but and then we had the the Yasha Monk um, allegations, which I think we talked about last month. That he, I mean, he basically did get fired, right? But just nobody is talking about it. Um, yeah, which is is sort of uh, it it is like in some sense a concession. But it's still meeting out the consequences. It's just sort of doing it quietly because now I think when you do publicly 
eviscerate me to somebody, right? Um, there's enough of a backlash. There's people who are fed up with it. Uh, there's a lot less credibility to those accusations than there was in 2017, which by the way, this is, you know, <laughs> one of the things that people who defended due process and, uh, you know, were against this entire sort of mob culture of me too said from the beginning that this is going to hurt the credibility of women who come forward with stories about sexual assault, right? Like that playing with this both politically and then in terms of, of the definition of what constitutes assault as opposed to a bad date. Um, <laughs> and I'm not even exaggerating because that was the, that was, I feel like that was the, the final Aziz on me too, the Aziz Ansari story. That was like literally a bad date. Um, I, I feel like there is a backlash and it is more balanced that way, but I don't know how much that helps specifically young men on college campuses because they're not being subjected to the mob for the most part. And so there's, you know, there's also no opportunity for them to fight back in the court of public opinion. Most of this happens behind closed doors. A lot of it you're not allowed to talk about. Um, what happens ultimately is if this kind of very unfair adjudication finds you guilty, you get suspended or expelled. And on your record forever, it says, you know, you were expelled from school for sexual misconduct. Um, and that affects your life for the rest of your life. And, and it has to so many men. Um, I, I, I worked with, uh, for a while, a great group called FACE. I can't ever remember what it stands for. Um, but mm -hmm. I will never forget talking to one of the founders. Um, these are this is a group that offers support services to uh, basically the falsely accused. And I mean, the number of suicides and suicide attempts among men who are put in this situation uh, is non-trivial. Uh, it, it really is one of the worst things, you know, a person can go through. We saw that when Kavanaugh was like so emotional and angry when he was answering those accusations. I mean, it, it is, People do take, you know, people take rape seriously, you know, contrary to <laughs> all of, all of the stuff from the feminist left. Like when people are, are accused of, of a heinous crime, they take it seriously. There were some polls at the time around me too, saying that men would much rather be accused of murder than sexual assault because they right. know, you know, like if I'm accused of murder, I can stand trial, um, you know, I'll have, I'll have the opportunity to proclaim my innocence and at least like some number of fair-minded people will believe me. But if I'm accused of, se of sexual assault, like I will have an unfair hearing behind closed doors and then I'll be labeled a sex offender and a criminal and like, you know, uh, somebody who does not um, treat women uh, with the respect that they deserve. And I, I will, you know, I, I won't have an opportunity really to answer that charge or to clear my name ever. And so, I mean, that, that, that poll really stuck out to me over the years. Like I re I remember that now, like, I don't know how many years it's been since they took that poll, probably six, but like, you know, that, that really, I think boils it down. Like if you're a man, you'd rather be accused of murder than sexual assault in the current culture. Yeah. It's interesting because it, it was this, it sort of did set the stage for, uh, how Me Too evolved right from its inception, where you had some really serious, like the situation on college campuses is actually always going to be serious because you have newly independent young people fueled by uh, this new independence and in many cases, alcohol and close quarters. Um, of course, there's always going to be a serious concern about the situation on college campuses when it comes to sexual relations between men and women. In the same way, Me Too took something that was actually very serious, some very serious initial cases, and it conditioned all of us to kind of accept these lowered standards of guilt, especially because it's all happening in the context of social media. And then when the backlash happened, it was real, but the the kind of cultural work had already been done. Um, you know, there was there was this collective lowering of the standards and the politicization, I think did not help one bit. Um, but it was like, by the time you had Emily Yaffe writing that excellent series in 2015, 
it was the damage kind of had gradually already been done. And, you know, while there are, I, I like your point, you know, while you could maybe read this, as I was arguing earlier, as a concession on Biden's behalf, uh, it's almost like it's a concession that they can afford to make because they made the progress they needed to culturally. Well, also, I mean, if you look at, and we should talk about how these Title IX standards have been covered in the media, because the answer is outside of independent media and outside of conservative media, not very much. Mm -hmm. um, but to the extent that it's been covered, the you know it, it's usually a couple throwaway sentences about this due process issue that completely mischaracterize it. It says, "Oh, it's 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 granting victims' rights." Um, or, or something like that. I, I can't remember the the phrases they use, but they're completely Orwellian. Where whereas these are, I mean, these are due process standards that courts repeatedly uphold, right? So these are due process standards that when the universities follow something that they're now being encouraged and indeed told to do on pain of leaving of of um, leaving their funding behind their federal funding, uh, by the way, which is something we should be doing a lot more often. From our perspective, we should be reining in the behavior of universities. They are dependent on federal money, um, and we should be using that because they are behaving like psychotics. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but, but uh, you know, they're telling universities to keep standards that are directly contrary to what the federal courts say is constitutional. Um, these are not. These are not what was the one of the phrases I, I read in like a USA Today article op ed was um, like protections for mm. for uh, people who commit sexual assault. Like, no, this is due pro the purpose of due process is to find the truth of the matter, it's to hold a fair hearing to determine whether somebody is in fact guilty of what he's being charged with. Um, and those due process standards are a benefit to everyone. Ultimately, anybody who is accused, whether it's in a courtroom or in one of these hearings, anyone who's accused of any kind of like either misconduct or criminal back to, you know, criminal behavior is owed. Like we, that's a, a basic plank of justice um, in the American system. And to see it characterized this way, I mean, is just ridiculous. Like, uh, like many things that the Trump administration did, right. It's Trump protects Trump administration protects <laughs> rapists or whatever, when all they're doing is duplicating what federal courts have said over and over hundreds of times at this point, like, no, universities, you can't do this. Um, you can't ruin someone's life because some biased Title IX investigator didn't even tell him what he was accused of, shove him into a hearing for three hours, and then like stamp him with you know, stamp him with the the golden R, I guess, or the, the what is it, the scarlet R on <laughs> on his chest for the rest of rest of his life. Those are like real substantive consequences that you're enacting, um, you know, outside of the court of law, and and you need to uphold higher standards of due process to do that. If you want, if you want to get into this game at all, if you don't, if you don't want to leave the adjudication of criminal assault to the courts. Um, and you want to adjudicate it as a matter of campus policy, well, then you're going to have to uphold higher standards of due process because this just isn't fair and it's contrary to the Constitution. That's literally all that the Trump administration regs said. They're just duplicating what is said in federal courts. But as is so often the case, universities are way more worried about administrative consequences than they are about being smacked by the federal courts, right? Uh, way more and more worried about their their activists left on campus than they are about a federal court every you know ten years where there's the one student who has the the will the money the backing to take this all the way to court over a course of years to clear his name you know okay they'll settle with him they'll write a you know quarter million half a million dollar check and that is worth it to them it's worth it to them to just keep on doing what they want. They want to comply with these new Title IX regulations. It was the Trump administration that was forcing them to actually uphold due process because those, again, those administrative consequences are a much bigger stick than having to settle in federal court. Yeah. And again, there's something, 
I also remember going back to when these debates were initially being litigated. I mean, just hearing you talk about the level of frustration with media coverage, I've been thinking a lot about the extent to which the gatekeepers have kind of lost power since, you know, about 2011, 2012 uh, with social media. And and that's in some ways that are good and some ways that are bad. But uh, one of the good ways is I do feel like there's more awareness of what's happening right now because the way the media presented this at the time, and especially on the women's sports stuff, I mean, it was, it was like the only people crying foul were conservative groups. Um, and because of that, nothing was taken seriously about the consequences that became manifest very easily and very quickly. And suddenly the media was like, oh, there, there might be something here, but they ignored it at the time. Uh, it, it was a total blackout on the kangaroo stuff. It, it, it's, the stuff. Old, it's the old uh, New York Times, all the news that's fit to print five years ago. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was like it was a, the kangaroo court stuff was such a complete blackout until like the end of the Obama administration. There would be good stuff in like Reason and the Washington Examiner, and a lot of it came from you and us. But basically, the media treated it as though Obama was cracking down on rapists, and anyone, anyone who was arguing against the Obama standards, which came to include like bar associations was doing the bidding of the rapists was part of at the time it was called the war on women uh the patriarchy these are all of the buzzwords that were being tossed around and it just swallowed whole cloth by the corporate media we're really putting the senior into into this conversation talking about the <laughs> obama administration <laughs> going back to <laughs> Um, but you know, Biden was part of like, you make this point all the time, Biden, it was Biden's initiative. He was the one out giving speeches on college campuses about all of this. He was obviously part of championing the gender identity stuff when it happened because he was the vice president. Uh, so in a way it's like, he has owned all of this stuff from the very beginning. Uh, it never went away, it, even though the Washington Post editorial board was pretty favorable to Betsy DeVos when she, you know, very gradually pulled these rules back. Um, it's like it's always been Biden's kind of always owned this stuff. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff has roots. I mean, I, I really don't, as you know, I don't have a lot of patience for the idea that this stuff sprung out of nowhere. Um, but there's a major piece of these regulations we still haven't discussed, uh, and that is the free speech component to this. Uh, there's a pronouns component, which is part of the gender identity stuff, which is, um, you know, if schools tolerate treating, like I said, treating uh, a student is harmful uh, to treat a student the way uh, that this, as the sex that he or she actually is, well, what happens when a fellow student, quote unquote, misgenders that person, right? What, what, it, what happens when a fellow student or a teacher uses the correct biological pronouns? Well, that's not just a gender identity issue. Um, that is also, oops, um, sorry about that, but that's, that's also a uh, free speech issue. Um, and then similarly, there is this, this, this vague definition of, um, Oh, sorry. I need to. Crap. Sorry, guys. Um, but there's this vague definition in here, uh, just as there were in the proposed rules about the expansion of harassment um, and what it means to harass somebody in a school, not going, following them around, you know, um, from class to class spouting, you know, unwanted sexual commentary. I think we would uh, all recognize that as a type of harassment that the school shouldn't tolerate. But now, you know, saying something about sex or gender that somebody else finds subjectively offensive um, potentially falls into what these regs say uh, is a violation of U.S. civil rights law, right? Mm. So there is this big free speech issue um, that's sitting there. And I, and I know you're, you're a pretty consistent uh, free speech defender. And we'll get to uh, the borders of free speech on, on Columbia's campuses uh, in a bit. But, um, you know, here we have this unconstitutionally vague. Again, like this is contradicting Supreme Court precedent on there is a tight definition, a relatively tight definition of harassment 
that the Supreme Court has laid out because there is this obvious gray area between what's harassment and what's protected speech. And here we have unelected bureaucrats saying, nope, we're going to pull your funding and you're in violation of U.S. civil rights law if you follow the standard of free speech that the Supreme Court says. Well, that, I mean, it just it's so outmoded at this point. Who, who would even think to follow <laughs> the standard of free speech that the Supreme Court set? But yeah, I mean, it's like this is we are on the precipice of becoming uh, the same reg sort of free speech regime that we see in a lot of places in Europe right now where you know jk rowling has been testing the limits of new policies in in scotland and it seems to have gone okay for her at this point so far but it's kind of similarly vague about what constitutes like criminal speech what constitutes hate speech and the entire left i mean and as you're great on this as you pointed out all the time they support the equality act uh they support uh the e equality act speech components uh, even speech groups say very little about this piece of legislation that is you know, hugely important to the left, that it's in basically every candidate's platform, every Democratic candidate's platform. They'll say, you know, on if you go to their website under like gender justice, it will say bullet point supports passage of the Equality Act, co-sponsored Equality Act legislation. Um, and, and so as soon as we got to this point in time where sex and gender identity were conflatable, um, legally, which happened via a dear colleague letter, uh, and then sort of spiraled from there. But as soon as we got to that point culturally, where we decided these things were interchangeable, the, the threats to speech became significant. And as much progress has been made on the question of women's sports, which is not to be taken for granted. I mean, people have worked very, very hard uh, IW is doing an excellent series right now on prisons and the the uh, fate of some very vulnerable women uh, in places like California. There have been cases on women's shelters on places like Alaska. Uh, as much progress has been made in some of these, I would say like uh, they shouldn't be low hanging fruit areas, but they are just for kind of public perception and all of that. This is not going away. It has not gone away because there's still a serious move uh, to convince people that sex and gender identity are interchangeable and not just that they're interchangeable, but that it constitutes either an act of violence or hate speech to say otherwise, to even argue against that. Uh, that has not gone anywhere uh, at all. And I think how comfortable they felt uh, sort of rolling out the policies you mentioned on this issue shows that it's not going anywhere, even as much progress has been made on, you know, for example, Leah Thomas. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the women's sports issue, and you're right, IW has done a lot of fantastic work telling some of these stories, uh, you know, getting involved in the states and, and helping to pass protections for the definition of sex on the state level. Um, but all of like I, I've always felt that the women's sports issue, although it is, is a great symbolic of you know sort of thing to point to, um, at the end of the day, there are way larger consequences for screwing with the definition of sex under law uh, than who's winning the two hundred meter butterfly. Um, it's just it's just a reality. It's it's I think the reason the sports issue is so salient is not because it's um, you know like obviously there are even safety concerns for, for athletes who are competing in this way. And there have been really bad injuries. Um, so it's, it, there's, a, there is like, I'm not saying it's not an important issue. Um, but I think, I think it, it is salient because it's so obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it is that, you know, emperor without clothes issue where when you see Leah Thomas, you know, lapping, <laughs> all of his female competitors in the pool. It's just very difficult to deny that it's unfair competition. Um, and so I think that is the reason that it, it you know, is the, the salient issue that it is, that sort of issue where the Biden administration wants to lie and dissemble about um, what he actually, his regulations actually are doing to women's sports. Um, but there are, as you point out, a lot of these other consequences on the on the speech point, right? So we're now talking about this this border between harassment and free speech and civil rights law. And that's all a great 
transition to the morass that is currently going on on a lot of these campuses, just up north and the northern part of Manhattan here. Um, there is, are these camping protests in Columbia. There have been incidents in universities like Columbia, and Yale, um, NYU, some of them amounting to something that starts to look a lot more like harassment, right? So some of this is clearly speech, even, um, you know, the Intifada revolution kind of chants. They're obviously something that would not be tolerated <laughs> with the preferred classes of the left, um, obviously something that would be considered intimidating, uh, racially intimidating. But uh, there's also things that even for me, or, or um, and I'm curious where you stand on them as sort of a free speech advocate who has, you know, defended people, protesters on the left, on the right. Um, I mean, some of these things, like if you're talking about singling out Jewish students uh, who are walking by, for example, and like surrounding them with people um, and and sort of <laughs> as they're trying to walk to class, I mean, that that starts to look a lot more like racial harassment to me where, um, you know, if the standard is that under our civil rights law, you know, every, everybody, regardless of their race or religion, is supposed to have educational opportunities, um, you know, the opportunity to exercise their right to go get an education in a federally funded institution, which even a private school like Columbia is. Um, the, I mean, there, I, this is borderline to me, although I, I have heard some characterizations of what's going on that I find a little bit hysterical. Interesting, because actually from the civil rights perspective, you're absolutely correct that by the standard the left has set for what constitutes um, gender or racial-based harassment, there's basically no question that even the people being hysterical, let's say from our side on this, <laughs> are pointing to things that would violate the left's own standard that they oh, don't. And like the list of schools that are currently under civil rights investigation, meaning that there have been complaints filed with OCR and the Department of Education, um, is long. It is like, I think it's like 30 schools that are currently under investigation under Title VI complaints for, you know, racial intimidation, racial harassment, um, basically the denial on a racial basis of the opportunity to fully engage as a student on the university campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's completely true. And, you know, just for my own purposes, because I know for sure I'm going to be getting questions uh, from the left and some of my friends on the left about this, I went and compiled some examples that, you know, again, there's some reporting suggesting that these are outliers, that there are tons of peaceful, if wildly, woefully misguided <laughs> students um, at Columbia and Yale who are, you know, violating, trespassing your rules at their school and, and might be in violation of the student code of conduct for those reasons, don't necessarily uh, breach or don't necessarily cross that boundary, um, you know, as we were just talking about, but there are examples that clearly, clearly do. And by the left standard, uh, almost all of them do because they've set such a low bar for this, but then it gets into the conversation about how they wield power with no serious regard for uh, consistency, uh, for logical, moral consistency, because it's all kind of ends justify the means. Uh, there are a lot of people on the left that obviously see it that way versus, you know, the right is constantly nitpicking about what is or what isn't, you know, the proper line of free speech and blah, blah, blah. The left just doesn't care. They're just like, we're wielding this for the sake of power when we do it. I think there's some truth to that, but there are just, there are clear violations, A, by the left standard and B, by any serious standard in this case. So I'll, I'll tell you how I see this and um, maybe you can either push back or, or I mean, I, I think as you said, and I agree with what you said, that there's, there are some clear cases that need to be brought because um, the civil rights law can't be a one-way weapon, right? Um, even if, if I'd prefer to see some of these reforms, especially the 90s changes to the Civil Rights Act rolled back, it, it can't be a one-way weapon, right? I mean, it can't be that the less preferred classes get to behave in whatever outrageous way uh, and intimidating way possible towards, you know, minorities on campus or, or dissenters on campus. 
Um, and, you know, we don't push back out of principle uh, because we don't agree with the way the law has been written or applied. I mean, I, I think that's sort of a foolish way uh, for the right to conduct itself. So I'm all in favor of, I mean, file those, file those complaints um, with OCR, you know, take, take these schools to court jeopardize their federal funding, which I mean, I think there's probably hundreds of reasons to, to pull their federal funding um, and to go further and actually tax their endowments. So, I mean, you know that I'm all about doing that. I, I mean, this is as good a reason as any, as far as I'm concerned, but there are many other reasons. Um, but then I hear the comparisons, right, to Nazi Germany or, um, and I sort of, balk at those comparisons in part because I think it is taking too defensive a posture. I mean, this is still America, right? The, the injuries that have happened are like some girl got hit in, in the eye with a, a flag, right? Um, I don't think this kind of low level violence as condemnable as it is, is like, I don't like to see um, emails going out to Jewish students saying, stay in your dorm. Mm hmm. Um, I don't think that's the right way to deal with these people. Mm. Um, I, I think that Jewish students should be out there. I mean, like if you're not willing to sort of risk for the most part, what happens is, is getting surrounded and yelled at, which is, is scary. Um, I'll admit, but, uh, you know, th the chance that you're going to be seriously injured or killed is very low. Um, I'm not saying it's zero. I mean, there, this is, uh, there, there does seem to be, it's like almost the Islamicized version of a left wing campus protest. And some of these people are very serious, right? Especially some of these off campus, older folks, um, some of them, you know, immigrants to this country from countries where violent Jew hatred is part of the culture and life. Um, so again, I, I don't think I can be accused of downplaying. I do think that there is a more serious risk of of anti-Semitism and serious anti-Semitism among the country's elite. Uh, but I think it goes a, a together in a, a whole package that is also anti-American. And, um, you know, it is, is I, the, to me, this looks like we're gearing up for the summer of Floyd in 2020, except it's the summer of Hamas, <laughs> right? And that telling Jewish students to hide in their dormitories or to treat this like Kristallnacht um, is exactly the wrong way to think about it. It's such a defensive way to think about it. I mean, this this country um, has been remarkably free of the kind of Jew hatred that other countries, I mean, th there's a whole interesting, I mean, I know uh, Walter Russell Mead wrote a fascinating book about, about that, why Americans support Israel, why um, anti-Semitism, although it existed in American history, was very mild in comparison to most European countries, right? Um, and let alone countries around the world. I, I actually tend to think, um, and this is just pure speculation, I do think that it has something to do with what uh, Steinbeck derogatively, <laughs> in a derogatory way, uh, talked about Americans, saying every American imagines himself a temporarily, temporarily embarrassed millionaire, right? That disproportionate Jewish success in various fields of, of, you know, mind like professorate or, um, or, you know, the various sciences and so on. Um, those things in America, like America is actually not very envious country. Mm -hmm. Um, and Americans tend to look up to people who are successful and say like, that's great. Like, how did you do that? How can I do that? You know? And I think that's a very healthy attitude, cultural attitude. I think it's part of the reason, um, that, you know, uh, Jews have not found America inhospitable uh, from the very beginning of the country. You know, think about hmm. George Washington's letter to the Hebrew congregation, right? Americans uh, have tolerated a Jewish minority uh, with with grace. I'm not saying there have Again, I know about the country clubs and I know- <laughs> Ulysses know S. Grant erasure. University admissions against Jews. Like I know all of that stuff. But if you compare it to pogroms in Europe, like it, it's just nowhere near. It was never- was never the kind of like rallying cry across, you know, the average American, um, uh, the way that it was in Europe. And I, I just, I don't want all of that to be subhumed into like, frankly, I think a lot of people who are treating it that way are so enmeshed in left-wing spaces that like, these are people who think that if they were hanging out in like Mobile, Alabama, 
right? That yes. they'd be chased with sticks because they're Jewish. And like the opposite is true. They're being chased with sticks in Columbia University by their fellow leftists. And the rest of America is very tolerant of Jews. Yeah, I, I could not agree with that more. I've actually been, I haven't heard anyone like else really give voice to that, but I've been thinking it internally. Just there's a an element we see it actually often, especially I would say with like the ADL, when they get involved in these things, they do engage in that. Uh, it, it, this isn't the most important. The ADL is a disgrace of an organization. Sorry. No, 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 no. But like they do engage in this sort of definition inflation that the right finds objectionable when it's, you know, anti when it's called anti-woman hate speech or whatever. And I don't think that's the most important element of the story. I don't think every conservative needs to be out there. Every pro-Israel person needs to be out there condemning that constantly because clearly the top line story here is that uh, there are people at college campuses who are saying things like al Qassam's next target. And that's part of, you know, standing with a poster pointing up at students waving, Jewish students waving uh, the flag of Israel. I mean, that's clearly the biggest story. Um, but the, the second part of it downstream of that, I think is important too. And again, it doesn't mean that there has to be obsessive gatekeeping and boundary policing by people on the right. Um, but I think it is really tempting to either engage in definition inflation or fragility, uh, politics because the left has done that for a decade plus now in a way that has severely undercut the ability of conservatives to make their case. Um, and to even just like speak freely, to think freely on college campuses. There's plenty of polls showing conservatives have self-censored uh, to a great degree on college campuses over the last decade. And so I agree. I just think it's it's very tempting to fall into that trap. The bigger picture is still you know, why were so many people or why are so many people taken in by the sort of oppressor oppressed ideology? Um, and I think, you know, you and I have an answer to that, which is years of conditioning uh, is from Howard Zinn, you know, you could, from what we could start the wherever from, you know, existentialism to Howard Zinn to, uh, you know, some people, our Catholic friends would start it at the printing press. <laughs> without going that far um i don't know when the printing press was happening the catholic church was engaging in some uh, interesting <laughs> of its own. Listen, <laughs> I, I, I was raised luther i am with you uh although i've, the, I've now i've now uh dinged the catholics for two episodes in a row i was thinking <laughs> john daniel davidson <laughs> Oh, good. Oh, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> I, I like John, by the way. I, I highly recommend last week's episode. I think his book's right up here. I think it's a, a really interesting read. I think uh, it's well worth it uh, to engage with these issues. But um, I so do think hear that, that a sort of soft Protestant consensus in America was broken by Catholic immigration. That doesn't mean that <laughs> I want to send them all back or anything. But um, <sighs> I, I do think it was sort of the big breach in a way, actually, that Jews were not uh, because Jews are by nature, like by the nature of the religion are, are not universal. And for the most part are looking for a place to, you know, practice their faith, uh, that's right. sort of different and, and separate, which also, you know, does a safe space, create trench tensions and so on with, with the country that, um, that they're, they're in sometimes, but like, uh, there, there just isn't this tension. Whereas Catholics, um, challenged Protestants within the institutions, um, and we're a more serious force than I think that's probably, if I look at where our legal, um, our legal structures around public sort of endorsement of religion start to break down. I think, I think I go immediately to the mid 19th century and to, um, things having to change and adjust for Catholic immigration in a way that like the small number of Catholics, the founding just didn't have the influence or the numbers to start making a claim on institutions in the same way. But um, I'm saying this sort of neutrally. I mean, a I'm powerful sort of argument against the history. state of Maryland. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there's, there's a, anyway, uh, we'll leave that to, to John Daniel Davidson. But um, no, I mean, I, I think the reason that the part of the sort of rising anti-Semitism that I find actually worrying is seems to me it's just like one more reason to worry about what you were saying about um you were indicating which is the the worldview the holistic worldview that has been 
spoon fed to at this point, at least two generations of American adults um, from kindergarten all the way through university. That's, that's the problem. And, and it doesn't surprise me when you see those polls where you see young people are, <laughs> I see it as a seamless hole. Like the reason that they hate Israel in these polls and have vastly different views than the generations that came before them on the U.S. Israel relationship, on anti-Semitism, on all of these, these things that are legitimately scary is the same reason they find Osama bin Laden's letter like compelling. I was thinking right? the same it, thing. Yeah. It's, it's not, it, 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 in, and yes, okay. There is this additional element of demographics where it's that progression of sixties leftism combined with mass immigration from places where it's a more ancient and more like sort of tribal lizard brain hatred. Um, and those things are blending in interesting ways um, in America. But to the extent that I'm worried about this, I was already worried about it because I don't want to be ruled in elite institutions by people who think that Osama bin Laden had a point about America either. So like the fact that they're also anti-Semitic and hate Israel is just like more reasons to be worried about these people being in any position of power. But I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't think like the larger, the rest of America is about to embark on a bunch of crystal knocks. No, and you're right, actually, because that's this. what happened with race relations in the United States. People have looked at, I believe it's the Gallup polls over time on uh, like race relations improving or regressing and all of that. And what we see when you know, what's popularly described as wokeness started to take hold midway through the Obama administration is a backsliding on people's perception of race relations in the United States. And it's really a lot of that has to come down to, frankly, this hysterical rhetoric in the media that is conditioning people. I mean, why do you get riots in 2020? Because there's been or you ask people how many um, unarmed black men are killed by police a year and they wildly overestimate the number. There's tons of research on this. Uh, and all of that clearly has to stem from the irresponsible, reckless, uh, quote unquote, woke rhetoric from the media. There's just no question about it. And so you really want to be careful. One of the saddest consequences of that is losing so, so much of the progress. And you really want to be careful um, with that rhetoric because it can actually poison the well. It can actually lead to backsliding. And honestly, we have seen some of this on the right. Um, uh, just in, you know, recent, especially, uh, in response to some of, like you said, Inez, maybe fragility politics is one way to describe it. Definition inflation. There's so many people on the right that are being sick of, uh, being told what to think, what not to think that they react some people in, uh, unhelpful and, uh, irrational ways by running to bigotry. And, uh, that's again, downstream a downstream consequence of some of the reckless rhetoric and so yes i i would urge people um to keep the big picture in focus and then also just be aware of adopting some of the same habits or falling into some of the same habits that uh the left that you know frankly we've opposed when they've been adopted by the left over the years because they don't produce an accurate rendering of where the country really is and they tend to reflect more of the online discourse than life in the rest of the country yeah i actually that's a good topic to to close out on on the 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 potential threat from the right, because I, I think I have maybe a different view, but we'll see. I just wanted to make a couple points. One, I mean, I can't remember if it was the ADL or some other organization, but it's an absolutely bad faith response to this. It's clear that they can't deal with the fact that this threat is coming from the left, um, and they have no courage in actually describing who is doing the Jew hatred. Like, <laughs> no they put out what was that that ad in the Super Bowl that was like some working class white kid in yeah. his dad's truck? Like no, it's like I'm American sorry. history Actually, X. The people who are tweeting Hitler is right or whatever. You know, nine out of ten of them are you know Muslim Arabs, and the tenth one is a woke person with blue hair. Like that mm -hmm. that is is the overwhelming places where those things are coming from, and you're not being honest about more than that, like where it's coming from. Who actually has the power? to implement anything that might actually 
you know, be worrying? Is it people who are in power in one of the most prestigious universities in the world? Or is it somebody who hurls a slur on Twitter? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I have no patience, honestly. Like, I'm very sick of the idea that the right wing is so scary because there's like the gripers or whatever. And yeah, like they look, I get a ton of this myself. I mean, you are Jewish, right? Like um, all the answers in my, my Twitter, whatever. I, I just don't build your politics about a, around a bunch of people who are most of them, first of all, are the essentially the, the, you know, teenagers scrawling bad words yes. on a locker, right? Yes. Like there, there is this irrepressible impulse to say the thing that the school moms don't want you to say. Um, right. And so I, I do think there's a real danger, but again, I don't think it's limited to anti-Semitism. Like when I think about somebody like Candace Owens now discovering that America bombed civilians in World War II. <laughs> um, I, by the way, I, I love it when people discover these things that everyone else knew and thereby just prove that they they were just idiots before and they're shocked, you know, like, like um, but but in any case, you know, I, I you know even people like Tucker who who now went on Joe Rogan and and said like, oh, it was so evil for America to use the bomb in World War II against Japan, right? I see this all as a piece of and and to that extent, it worries me. I'm not worried about specifically anti-Semitism on the right. I'm I'm not even particularly worried. I mean, I, I disagree with some of the Nietzschean right. Mm. Um, but I, I just don't, I, I don't have the same horror to the right. I mean, these are people who, as far as I'm concerned, disagree with me on some things and agree with me on others. And like, some of them are nasty on Twitter. Like, okay, I mean, how old are you? That that's what's governing your politics, right? Um, um, I'm just, I'm just much less worried about, about the, um, the sort of trolley right on the internet, um, in part because I don't think they have a lot of power, in part because I think, think it's a troll response to what you can and can't say. Um, to the extent that I'm worried, quote unquote, at all about this coming the right, it's a lot, Emily. Actually, institutions have deservedly lost trust. Um, but that makes people, I think, really apt to just trust whoever like says the craziest thing, you know? Um, and mm -hmm. to the extent that I think there's a danger there, it's less specifically about anti-Semitism and more of this kind of response of like, wow, did you know that America used the bomb in World War II? Like <laughs> um, that, 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 that level of skepticism where you, you no longer are evaluating issues in light of not trusting the institutions, but just reflexively taking whatever position on even, you know, on World War II politics that, uh, you know, the blob or whatever in foreign policy has, has um, disavowed. I mean, that kind of stuff is unthinking. I do think that it can lead to a stupider right wing. Um, Right about the right wing devolving into like Candace Owens versus Alex Jones on World War II politics than, <laughs> than I am um, about like the the scary like racist right or whatever. Um, by the way, did you see that Alex Jones came out and was? Can you hear me? Now you're back. Oh. Oh, you left that fun, uh, Alex Jones. Did you see that that Alex Jones came out and was like, actually, guys, you're wrong. Hitler was a bad guy. <laughs> I, I didn't see that. But like as a closing thought, I agree completely. And this is just the Inez and Emily agree hour, I guess, although I disagree. Um, I think I disagree with you on Tucker, which is a can of worms that we won't open up now on uh, <laughs> the use of nuclear weapons. Um, but I do think the burden here is not on the people who distrust everyone. I think that's the wrong place to pay, to put the burden. You know, if you're getting into bigotry, yes, you deserve the burden. But if you just simply distrust the establishment, whether it's the media establishment, corporate establishment, political establishment, you are rational. You have every reason to distrust these people. And instead of earning back that trust in earnest, 
uh, everyone is just like digging their heels in, sprinting in the opposite direction, making the situation so much worse. And you're going to get more Candace Owens. Uh, the the less interested you are in actually, um, you know, accepting the problem. First step is admitting you have a problem, media, and then course correcting. Um, you're just going to create more distrust, and that's going to breed so many different downstream problems. And, you know, it's a vicious cycle. You're going to keep blaming the Candace Owens, uh, but most importantly, keep blaming the Candace Owens fans, the people who start falling into that camp, instead of uh, the, the conditions and the way that you created the conditions for that distrust to be sown. Uh, with that, we'll, we'll wrap up. Thank you, Emily, once again, as always, for, for coming on High Noon. Thanks for having me. And thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Stepman, including After Dark, is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to Inez.Stepman at IWF.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or IWF.org. Be brave, and we'll see you next time on High Noon.